Thank you so much, James. I'm after Joel's example of the, the little box, I just thought, yeah, it's too good to miss. I have to be up here on this box. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I want to say a huge thank you to Mark for well, all his work in organising this event and his general good humour and his generosity and the fact that he's just been absolutely amazing to um, kind of work with in planning the trip. And it's been such a wonderful event so far. I feel very, very privileged to be here. Um, I feel quite emotional. I've uh, shed a number of tears over the last couple of days. I don't know if it's just to do with um, jet lag and you know being exhausted or whether it's actually to do with just how moving and poetic and eloquent so many of the talks have been. And um, yeah, I really sort of feel that after Ivana's talk and Linda's talk, Lee's talk, Eve's talk, Michelle's talk, the list goes on, that um, I just have a real anxiety now about what I could possibly add, really. It just feels like um, so much has been said and it's been really kind of very, very moving. And it's really something about the moving nature of this that I kind of want to speak about because I'm very, very interested in the affective landscape of neoliberal academia and the way that it's characterised by anxiety and shame and fear and terror and worry about keeping up and insomnia and exhaustion and spiralling rates of mental and physical illness and um, see I'm the upbeat light relief <laughs> speaker. <laughs> um, but generally, kind of by, by all these kinds of experiences, um, and most of us can see them all around us and we can feel them. Um, Lee talked yesterday about, you know, sitting in these L-shaped chairs and we can feel these things in our bodies, in our aching backs, in our difficulty in falling asleep at night because our minds are just buzzing and we're feeling very, very anxious about everything we have to do. Um, and we can see it as we look around in the number of colleagues that we see who are getting sick. Um, and yeah, these kinds of things. So I'm very, very interested in what Ivana was talking about yesterday about neoliberalism, but um, I'm particularly interested in thinking about the psychic life of neoliberalism there with a kind of nod to Judith Butler and her work on the psychic life of power because I'm interested in how these things that are happening in our neoliberal corporatized institutions are kind of getting inside us and reshaping our subjectivities, damaging and changing our relationships. So um, just briefly, some things that are probably a little bit relevant about me. First of all, that I'm a feminist scholar. Um, secondly, that I've kind of come from an, an activist background and, and come out of a tradition of, of many decades of activism. And thirdly, that I've been working over the last 10 years or so um, on media workers, on cultural and creative workers. They've been um, the people that I've been doing research with. And what happened for me basically was that I would be doing research with say web designers or people working in the film industry and listening to their stories, listening to what their working lives were like, what were their challenges, what were their experiences and I was just struck time and time again by the resonances between the stories that they were telling me and what I was feeling myself about academic life and what my colleagues were telling me. So their stories about precariousness, their stories about long hours, about the intensification and extensification of work, their, their experiences of what it's like to live in a reputation economy where you know, you're only as good as your last job, you're only as good as your last paper, your last book. Um, what it's like to, to live and work in a kind of working environment where networking is absolutely demanded, it's not an optional extra. Um, even when you don't feel like it, even when you're not feeling that, that robust. And also really struck by the way that the kind of do what you love ethos, that kind of sense of having a passionate attachment to your work, um, that romantic idea of the creative, the artist, the filmmaker, but also the academic, um, the way that that kind of becomes a disciplinary technology within our neoliberal 
um, work situations, what, lo what Laurent Berlon calls um, cruel optimism, what Angela McRobbie has talked about in terms of self-exploitation, how that passionate binding to the work becomes a mechanism that actually causes you to work harder and harder. Andrew Ross has talked about it in terms of sacrificial labour. And I guess the last thing that I was really struck by in terms of a similarity um, was really picks up on what Joel was just talking about in terms of the myths of meritocracy that are circulating in the fields of creative media, the fields that I've been working in. Um, these kind of myths of egalitarianism. So I would be kind of going into these supposedly sort of cool working environments full of creatives and I'd be hearing this talk about it doesn't matter if you're black or white, gay or straight, male or female, as long as you're creative. And, you know, basically <laughs> the very, very short kind of message of my research is it absolutely does matter. It completely does. That's <laughs> such a myth. Um, so I, I guess I was just really struck by these resonances and I thought I, ca I can't put this off any longer. I actually have to do some work on and with academics um, because it seems as if despite our kind of self-proclaimed reflexivity we hadn't really turned the lens on ourselves we hadn't really kind of actually turned that lens back on us and looked critically at our, our own working experiences and that seems all the more surprising given the kind of transformations that we've been talking about here the kind of what Ruth Barkan calls massification marketization internationalization so much work that's examining the assault on the very idea of the university the way it's being structurally redefined and reinvented by systematic corporatization and privatization and by neoliberal shifts in funding regimes that are devolving more and more of the costs to the individual student who's now been of course reimagined as a consumer in the UK, our students, after three years, are saddled with an average of £50,000 worth of debt. So I think that's around $100,000 here um, by the time they complete their three-year degree. And the changes, which I barely need to, to speak about, really, are about the importing of corporate management techniques into university life, the reformulation of the very idea of of um, education in instrumental terms that are connected to business and the economy, the expansion of student numbers without a corresponding increase in staff, the proliferation of, of new and distinct regimes of audit and surveillance and calculation, the new entanglements between the university and the state's um, apparatus of immigration control. Um, that's absolutely terrifying in the UK at the moment because um, academics are being asked effectively to become staff of our border agencies, policing um, who's allowed to study in UK universities. Um, and now we're also being charged with spotting radicalisation. So it's, we're also being kind of interpolated to um, get into the, the war on terror. Um, so I mean, that I suppose what I'm trying to convey is that the changes that we've experienced um, has been so speeded up, so precipitate, it's barely possible, even for those of us who work within the university, to actually keep up with and make sense of what's happening. It seems as if new things are happening all the time. Literally, you, you know, you, you can't keep up with it. And inside, there's this sort of pervasive sense of crisis and outside, I think there's just kind of disinterest and complete bewilderment. I don't think there's much of a sense of what's actually going on. Um, and everybody's exhausted, of course, and what we're, what, you know, just to speak of a few campaigns that I've been involved in in the last couple of years, um, the anti casualization campaign, the fact that they've um, attacked our pensions and radically cut the value of our pensions. So our, pension campaign, we've been on strike because of that, um, the Justice for Janitors campaign, the fact that they've privatised all of our um, facilities like cleaning, um, cleaning and catering facilities have all been privatised and contracted out to these um, companies and 
We've been campaigning for the workers within those companies to actually um, make the living wage, not the minimum wage, which is what they had been earning. Um, and the campaigns around not doing the work of the border agency. So many different things, but they're all kind of atomized individual campaigns. And I suppose what I really appreciate about this conference is the fact that it's not about those kind of individual isolated campaigns. It's actually about thinking together about challenging all of this and seeing the connections between it and, and envisioning something different. Um, so I wanted to say something about what I see as the silence beyond those individual campaigns. And um, it's not a complete silence because actually, you know, we talk about this stuff all the time. We all talk about, you know, with our colleagues, with our friends, we talk about um, how stressed we're feeling, how many essays we still have to grade, how much work we still have to do, how we had to say no to that reviewing request because we were absolutely at breaking point. We talk about this all the time, but it doesn't have proper channels. It only gets talked about informally. It gets talked about in the coffee breaks at the conference. It gets talked about in the corridors. It never ever, at least in the UK, makes it into an official zone. So it's really bizarre if you're thinking about kind of what it would be like for a historian who was kind of going to look at the archive in years to come and look back on, well, what was the texture of life like for people working in universities? Because there is no record of all that stuff. It's not, you know, it's not being minuted. It's not actually appearing. But it's there for all of us, and we're, we're talking about it informally. But there's something about the quality of the talk that is highly personalised and highly individualistic um, and it's kind of racked by shame and racked by fear so there's lots and lots of talk about oh god I'm just I'm not keeping up I'm I'm really really worried I just haven't been able to get on top of my emails um, I don't think I'm going to be able to meet meet the deadline it's very much framed in that kind of slightly ashamed register um, marked by fear and anxiety um, it's also marked by a kind of guilt. I think there's, and that's another silencing mechanism when people um, feel privileged for being in the academy, um, wherever they've come from. When, when you're there, there's, it's still kind of perceived as a position of privilege. And there's such a guilt around that that we kind of feel, well, how can we talk about this when we're so fortunate? Um, and I think overall, just a kind of lack of a politicised vocabulary for talking about it. So it's still framed very much in terms of personal experiences, but not um, in a politicised kind of register. And I was really struck by what Eve was talking about earlier, about um, sort of um, thinking about social change and thinking about the sort of genres of critique that exist um, within within the social sciences and I was, I was kind of reflecting on that and worrying, oh, am I falling into this kind of a, a raising awareness kind of talk? But I think it isn't, it isn't quite that genre. It's more um, breaking the silence, but um, it's not an absolute silence, but it's making, it, making those things that we all know already, but making them knowable in a new, hopefully more politicised um, language. So, six years ago, I wrote a very, very personal piece um, called The Hidden Injuries of the Neoliberal University. And it was kind of an autoethnographic piece. And it was based on my experiences, the experiences of my friends, the colleagues that, you know, I talk openly with my PhD students. Um, and I used fragments from conversations. I used kind of... Uh, official letters that I'd received from university management. I even included a journal rejection letter that I'd um, received. Um, but it was a very much a kind of personal piece reflecting on the experiences of working in the neoliberal academy. And it kind of became a bit of a lightning rod. I have received thousands and thousands of emails in response to this one piece. 
Um, I still, you know, it's six years since it's been published, I still get two or three every week and people are kind of writing and saying, thank you, I never knew that other people felt like this, you've saved my life, I'm having such a hard time, I don't know what to do, can I tell you my story, I must just tell you about this. Um, it kind of had that effect and so it's built up for me a very kind of vivid, quite heartbreaking picture of what it's like to work in the neoliberal academy and the sort of texture of the experiences and above all how isolated people feel. So, how am I doing for time? I... Oh good, good, good. So, I sort of so I wanted to just kind of pull out three themes, and there could have been so many more themes, but I just wanted to speak about um, three different themes, and, and the first of them is precarity, living precarious lives. Um, and I'll start with a, a quote. Um, I've been living from hand to mouth on temporary teaching contracts for 10 years now. I've written two books, I get great teaching feedback, but I just can't get a job. I just don't know how much longer I can continue like this. Now, in the popular imagination, academics are amongst the most privileged of workers, um, blessed with tenured positions, supposedly, long holidays, leisured lives. Um, this may have had some truth, perhaps, in some of the world's elite institutions many, many years ago, but today it's unrecognisable. Um, and like the myth of egalitarianism, I think it exerts its own toxic and silencing effects because today precariousness rather than security is the defining experience of academic life, particularly but not exclusively for younger or career early staff, a designation that now can extend for your entire career um, given how few opportunities there are for the development of a secure employment position Statistical data about the employment of academics shows the wholesale transformation of higher education over the last two decades with the systematic casualisation of the workforce. So in 2015, our Higher Education Statistics Agency in the UK reveals that one third of academic staff in universities is employed on short term temporary contracts. But this figure actually excludes more than 80,000 people who are paid by the hour and therefore don't appear in those statistics, suggesting that the true extent of casualisation is far greater and it's increasing rapidly. Um, and it's been going up and up and up. And our union has said that higher education is the second most casualised sector of employment in the UK only the hospitality industry has a greater proportion of temporary workers and casuals. I think it's similar in the US. I know it's similar in Australia. Um, May and colleagues argue that 60% of Australian academics are now on temporary contracts. And as Ruth Barkan comments, this is an intellectual and social catastrophe masking as flexibility. Short-term research positions, lectureships, teaching fellowships in which, as a cost-cutting measure for universities, work that would once have been rewarded with a permanent position is repackaged for lower pay, stripped of benefits and any sense of obligation or responsibility to the person employed, leaving them without income over vacation periods. That nevertheless can seem like the aristocracy of labour compared with the hourly paid teaching positions in these, PhD students and new postdocs are charged with delivering mass undergraduate programmes with no training and no support. The pay in these positions frequently only rewards contact hours, meaning that preparation, marking, pastoral care of students, all these things are not remunerated at all. So staff in these positions frequently comment that if they were making this a kind of a rational economic decision, they would be much better off just working in a bar. But of course, that's not the only factor. And as we see in the cultural and creative fields, to, they're trying to gain experience, build their CVs with the hope of a, obtaining more secure employment. So this is hope labour par excellence. Um, 
There are also predictable patterns relating to gender, race and class. Jill Blackmore argues that restructuring has led to the remasculinization of the centre or core and a flexible peripheral labour market of increasingly feminised, casualised and deprofessionalised teachers. In the 27 countries of the European Union, women constitute only 15% of full professorships and their underrepresentation is even more stark if you look at other forums like editorial boards, um, the boards that give out grants, um, obviously vice-chancellorships, um, etc. In um, 2013, the Times Higher produced its first ever global gender index, which showed what it described as startling levels of sexual inequality among staff. And Diane Ray distinguishes between what she dubs academic capital and academic labour, positing women as the feminine lump and proletariat of academia. So for most people on these kinds of short-term, poorly paid academic positions, the experience is marked by stress, anxiety, uh, inability to make plans, either personal plans or occupational plans for the future. Um, they frequently understand these periods of casualised employment uh, are to be expected, but then are distressed that they go on for so long and frequently face agonising decisions about how long to chance it. As one woman put it, I feel I owe it to myself to try because I've invested so much in this, but I'm 30 now and I can't keep existing on a month-to-month -month basis. I have to put a time limit on how long I can hold out. And another told me, this is the first time in 10 years that I've headed into a summer knowing where I'm going to be living at the start of term. So there's just this sense of personal and social crisis that I think is absolutely endemic and deeply, deeply felt amongst many academics, even those for whom precarity doesn't take so, such obvious forms. We've collectively had to become this mobile, agile, flexible workforce prepared to move, to relocate cities, to relocate countries, to respond with what Nigel Thrift calls hair-trigger responsiveness to new calls for papers, new funding streams, new potential areas of student demand. You know how we've just constantly having to reinvent ourselves to fit into these new demands? Um, and for every fashion on engaging users or developing in impact. But this has had a huge cost psychically. So I just want to move on to my second theme um, of the three, and that's time stress. Um, and the subheading to this is, if I didn't have to sleep, it would be all right. <laughs> so anyone, I think, who spent the briefest time with academics during the last decade can't help but be struck by a profession that is stretched to breaking point. Time after time, surveys underline this, highlighting very high stress levels, considerably higher than average, which are increasing year on year, along with disorders of anxiety and depression. Mike Krang argued that the one thing that's perhaps the biggest source of dispute, anxiety and stress in academia is time. Academics want more time to research, they don't have enough time to read, they spend too much of their time at work, they can't spend enough time with their students, <coughs> they can't fit their job into the available time, they don't have time for anything outside work, children, friends, other activities. And then we're subjected to the poisonous myth that we're time rich and leisured. Um, and there's a structural issue here, obviously, about spiralling demands of the job, um, and also the kind of requirements to do more with less um, through the transformations brought by ICTs. Have a Moodle or a WebCT course alongside your course. Tweet about seminars and events. Develop a Facebook um, page for your course that the students can engage with. And then on, alongside that, there's the whole proliferation of audits and monitoring and surveillance activities that we're required to be involved in that take up more and more of our time in the most soul-destroying way. Um, so in the older, that's the pre-1992 institutions in the UK, we, our universities are um, divided into two broad types, the, the ones that were made um, universities after 1992 and the, the older institutions. If you work in an older institution, basically 
your employment contract doesn't specify your hours. So basically, it, it will be worded in a kind of way that highlights a general commitment to your three areas of work, which is teaching, admin and research, um, and other duties as and when directed by the head of department, which can cover a multitude of sins. Um, so it combines a kind of open-endedness about the tasks that we're required to perform and a, an indeterminate amount of time in which to perform them. So the job will never be done. And this is, in fact, the experience of more and more academics um, whose hours routinely exceed the 46 per week, which is specified by the European Working Time Directive that our government is trying to get us out of. Um, so, in, in fact, uh, as long ago as 2006, our union used official statistics to calculate that academics were working on average nine extra hours per week, or, to put it another way, which is really interesting in what you can do with numbers, were working for free for three months per year. And I think this is really, really interesting given the kind of um, intense attention that free labour has been getting in the form of unpaid internships. And yet this is another form of free labour that is completely invisibilised and just isn't getting that um, attention. And it's not by chance, um, it's systematically rendered invisible by the university accounting procedures. So one of our things, I'm sure this will be familiar to everybody, we have this um, thing called TRAC, Transparency Accounting Exercise, I can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for, but every few months, every term I think it is, we get asked to account for how we've spent every fraction of our time. And it's, it's just a complete nightmare. But one of the, the features of this accounting online system is that you cannot put down that you've worked more than 37 hours per week. <laughs> I mean, everyone's working more than 37 hours per week, but it won't let you do that. If, if you do that, it just it won't let you submit the form, and then it can tell you that if you don't want to enter hours, you can put it down as percentages. So it's not, it's not by chance. It's absolutely built into the system that they won't allow us to, to tell them how hard we're working. So academics are just finding it impossible to get their work done in the so-called normal working week and having to work evenings, weekends, getting up earlier, going to bed later. Um, Melissa Gregg has talked about this as anticipatory labour and for many of us this centres on email. And I think emails become emblematic of our experience of anxiety and stress and overload. It's always there, it's never done. People are sort of snatching time on the run to re send their replies that say, sent from my iPhone or sent from my Samsung Galaxy or whatever. But even this kind of constant um, running and availability and responsiveness is just generating more messages that require attention. Now, Mark Fisher, in his kind of critique of, of capitalist realisms, argued that emails hacked into libido and that's what accounts for its compulsive quality. But I would turn that around and say it's hacked into anxiety. Um, because when I talk to academics about email, the anxiety and the suffusion of talk about email by anxiety is absolutely the most important thing. Um, anxiety about missing something important, about finding something upsetting in your inbox, um, above all, simply about keeping up with the constant stream of communications. And I'm sure that you all recognise the way it's become a sort of tawdry academic competitive support sport, comparing how many emails, unread emails you've got in your inbox. It's like, oh, I've got 326. Oh, that's nothing. I've got 675. And, um, and we go off and we teach. We come back after teaching. We find there's 50 new emails. If you go out of the office for an entire day to go to a conference or attend a meeting, you have to start a whole day's new work just to deal with the messages that have come in whilst you were out. One colleague told me recently that after a full day of sitting on appointment boards in her department, she had 534 new inbox, emails in her inbox when she got back to the office at 7pm, at which point she'd already been at work for 11 hours. 
So um, it's, I mean, I could say a lot more about this, but I think I'd better skip on. I'm very interested in, in email. I, I'll skip on to my last um, little segment, which is about surveillance culture. And I just wanted to start this by showing you a short clip from something called the Department of Omni Shambles, which is a satirical critique of what's happening in higher education. And this one um, asks us to imagine what it would be like if Karl Marx was working in contemporary academia and going for his end of term departmental review with his head of department. Ah, Dr. Marx. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in for this assessment. Hi. So, Carl, I really like what you did with what was it? Das Capital? Great stuff. Thanks. I aim to please. In terms of impact points, it scored very highly. Very highly indeed. Great what you did with the whole 20th century, those revolutions and whatever. Massive impact points there. Right. Thanks. But, obviously not a peer-reviewed document. So I can't. Count it towards your publications for the REF assessment. And that's kind of a problem. Oh? I mean, a man can't live on impact alone, if you know what I mean? And departmentally, I'm sorry to say you're just not pulling your weight in terms of publications. Well. What about the Communist Manifesto? That had a lot of citations. That falls into the same trap I'm afraid, Carl. It doesn't help the REF at all. Where's the new work? Well, well, I... I got a little bogged down with some of the new administrative duties. Seriously? Yeah, I mean, some of the... What are you? A posy or something? But don't you agree that the managerialization of education destroys the possibility of independent thought? We're in this together, Carl. We're all in the same boat with that. You think you're special? No, I just thought. Now what about the matter of your student evaluations? Not so hot, Carl. The online module evaluation shows, how shall I put this? Well, you're letting your customers down, Carl really letting them down. They're paying for a service and they want value. Value for money. But, but, that's exactly what I'm trying to show. I mean look at this one at random, I quote. Professor. Marx didn't use PowerPoint and he didn't email us his notes. Afterward. Typical. But it's completely tautologous that a student would know whether his own education was best served by the or here's another. Quote, Professor Marx told us the bourgeois elite from which we come was expropriating the labor value of the poor and the wretched. It made me feel guilty and bad. I don't see why I should pay to be made to feel guilty and bad. Tut, tut, <laughs> Carl. Frank. There's uh, some great, there's, it's a fantastic site, the Department of Omni Shambles. Um, they've got, you know, student feedback on Immanuel Kant's essays and um, how Einstein would have fared in the research excellence framework and things like that. So I just thought it was a, a good example of um, our kind of surveillance culture. And it's interesting how there hasn't been much attention to surveillance within academia, I think, until quite recently. Um, and, you know, rightly in other fields of life, surveillance has become a really important object of study and activism in, in part in recognition of the role that's being played by digital technologies in the monitoring and control of employees. So, for example, the crossover of electronic tagging technologies from the criminal justice and detention system into regular employment situations. So now workers like refuse collectors, care workers, postal delivery workers are kind of routinely tracked as they move through different geographical spaces. And of course there's been loads of work on call centres and lots of work on warehouses um, with technologies that track how quickly workers make their grabs and so on. But 
by contrast to those fields of work, these kind of high-end professional workers like academics have not had much attention. Um, but we're becoming, I think, in a different way, one of the most surveilled occupational groups. Um, Roger Burroughs has recently argued that in the UK, any individual academic is now ranked and measured on more than 100 different scales and indices at any one time that measure academics' value and try and monetize them. So we're, we're ranked on how much grant income we bring in, what our research excellence score is, our citation scores, our student evaluations, our esteem indicators, our impact factor, the impact factor of the journals we publish in, our PhD completions. The list just goes on and on, literally over a hundred of these metrics. And in, in addition to these kind of individual measures, um, there are new nested evaluations that are kind of composites of these, which Roger Burroughs calls metric assemblages, which then literally just take on a life of their own. Um, they, they, they become kind of semi-autonomous actors that do things in the world. They generate funding, they damage reputations, they single out people for redundancy, they close down courses. They kind of, it's, a, it's an example of power at a difference. Um, but it's also producing new structures of feeling in the academy and, and contributes to our own self-surveillance and our own self-monitoring and commodification and the way that we're incited to view ourselves through these metrics. Um, and it produces a new kind of precariousness, a new kind of precarity that, as Brett Nielsen's pointed out, it doesn't just go all the way down in terms of it goes all the way down into our deepest psyche, but it also goes all the way up structurally and institutionally. It renders everybody insecure and precarious and at risk. Um, and people are, are constantly worried about, um, you know, because these, these surveillance things have no concept of history. It's like the clock stops and it restarts again at the next um, exercise that if you just haven't produced in that period for whatever reason, then you're rendered insecure, your job's insecure, you could be put on a teaching only contract. It, it creates quite profound sense of precariousness. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I will just come to a, a conclusion really, but just wanted to say how we're exhorted to, through, to view ourselves through the optic of these metrics which are now kind of permeating every sphere of our working lives and dictating the worth of everything that we do. And this was really kind of compellingly argued a couple of years ago when two feminist geographers asked the question, how many papers is a baby worth? Because we were having our, um, our last REF, our last research excellence framework, and basically, uh, people were saying, hey, if you've been on maternity leave, if you've been on other kinds of leave, then you shouldn't, have, shouldn't be expected to have produced as much. And Hefke eventually came up with a calculation, and they, the answer is one. It's worth one paper. So <laughs> if, you've, <laughs> if you've had a baby, you are entitled to submit one fewer papers um, in the REF. <laughs> And that was a result, believe me. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to conclude by saying something about our complicity in these processes. And even the time that I've been an academic, I think I can feel the shift when, from a moment where early on in this kind of auditing regime, it was felt as something alien. It was felt as something that had been imposed from the outside on us. Um, to the situation today where it actually feels as if these things are being treated as if they're real and meaningful and the distress that they cause is palpable. Um, just very, uh, uh, you know, very, very uh, difficult and it goes across all the different levels of academia. So I'll just read you um, an email, I uh, sorry, a text message I received from a friend saying, um, Hi Roz, I really wish I hadn't come into work today. The atmosphere is terrible. Emails have just been sent to inform people if they're going to be in the REF. Morale is very, very low. I saw 
ex, who's her head of department, crying. This is so poisonous and so destructive. I hope you're having a better day than me. And I think what it captures is not just how miserable people are feeling, but how enmeshed and entangled we all are, whether we like it or not. So it's not just living with the H index, but it's actually living in it, through it, and being governed by it. And I think the challenge that we're all here today to discuss is how to resist and how to reclaim universities as different kinds of spaces of openness and freedom and generosity and collegiality. So I'll end there. Thank you. It is. We, you know, that, that image is also uh, a problem in terms of its sexism and its privilege and whiteness and so on. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, uh, but it is very interesting. I think it's, it's even interesting kind of what rhetorical, what ideological work those kinds of books do in kind of conjuring a myth of the university and how, how that myth has a longevity that persists, you know, way beyond um, how things have changed. Thank you very much. Um, one comment I just want to make in, in, in response to what you said was one of the concerns I have is about the sort of intergenerationality of these conversations. Um, new, newer faculty, faculty who have come on since, say, the mid-2000s, um, you know, in my case, I've been I've been in an academic position for six years. Pardon me. Um, we're not necessarily we don't necessarily know what it was like a couple of decades ago. And one of the things that I'm quite concerned about, just talking to my colleagues, is how few of them understand how much things have changed. Mm -hmm. And I wonder a lot about how we can better share that amongst from sort of the mentorship through mentorship or through whatever means between those older maybe older, wiser, I don't know, I'll say it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, colleagues and, and those of us who've only been here since things have been, you know, the way that people are describing them. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's a really, really important um, comment. And it re also really resonates with feminism, I guess, as well. Um, I, I just think it's, it's very, very important to have those intergenerational conversations. And I do, I see kind of misunderstandings going in, in both directions, and it's really, really um, painful, I think, for everyone involved. I mean, um, there, are, there, are, there are lots of, uh, well, there are, the, the main activism that has been in the UK around sort of academic labor has been around kind of newer, younger scholars and casualization and, and kind of very, very precarious workers. Um, but then at the other end of the spectrum, there's been activism around pensions. And I've seen um, kind of standoffs between people where there's just a complete lack of solidarity. Um, and it's as if kind of the older approaching retirement academics, I don't know, they're very eager to get out um, and aren't, aren't kind of willing to stand up and fight necessarily. But equally, though, that I've heard kind of newer faculty say, why should I defend their pensions? I don't even have a secure job. And to me, this is very, very distressing. Both of those kinds of responses are very distressing because what we know from all political movements is we have to have solidarity and we're much, much stronger together than we are apart. And we actually, you know, have to create some sort of transversal politics that recognizes the differences in how people are positioned, but nevertheless kind of can act <coughs> together, I think. 
thank you. Well, um, absolutely wonderful to hear you. And uh, I, I was hearing sort of resonances of what uh, Joel had said with respect to an American communicating to Canadians. This is what the future looks like, beware. And then this is what I hear from you as well. And I've heard from other colleagues, both in the States and the UK. So uh, thank you for confirming that. <laughs> If thanks is that, yeah, thanks is the right word. But um, so my question is somewhat related. Um, I had the great pleasure and honor of sitting with a group of grad students last night when we had the roundtables. And um, uh, so here are these uh, younger scholars who are committed to the exploration of ideas and the uh, sharing of them and uh, um, the, uh, carrying these explorations further. So what's, what's your advice or what kind of conversations do you have with your own grad students? Because I, I have more and more of mine saying, once they see the, the, the down press and the, the intensification and extensification, as you said, they're just shaking their hands and their heads and saying, I, I may be out of here completely by the time I'm done, but then, then some are getting kind of drawn into it, largely through casualization. So, any, any thoughts on, that you want to share on what you say to your own grad students or what kind of conversations you have? Yeah, I mean, I just try to, um, you know, tell it how I see it, basically, and um, not, not wanting. I think that very often the experience of the PhD student, you know, it's really tough, you're working so hard. Um, I think in the UK probably you're more isolated than you are here because you don't have the kind of grad student programs to the same extent. It's much more a kind of individual work with your supervisor. And they're kind of looking forward to this time when they're going to be beyond that and going to be properly in the academy and kind of in this almost kind of mythologized academy of, um, you know, maybe more like how we might hope it would be in terms of working collectively and producing knowledge and being critical um, and I try not to kind of like destroy people's hope of course and uh, but I you know I, I give this kind of talk to PhD students a lot and um, increasingly what it seems to spark is kind of recognition that that's what it's like, but kind of going in with eyes open and struggling to make it different. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what you say. If there's something that you say or other people in this room could offer that would. Well, I'll, I'll look out for really briefly. I try to be as honest and truthful as I can too. I just talk about the. Uh, I, I have my own graduate students um, uh, keep a log of their own what their own week looks like, and especially for those who are, um, have partners and families and things like that and are holding down several jobs off them. And just to look at that and then I share what my week looks like in terms of hours spent doing X, Y, and Z um, and how certain things fall off the map. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I'm quite blunt and I say, if you can think of another way of exploring ideas in a meaningful way with other collectives, um, seek those out, but know that you you are in a place where these things can be talked about. Um, is a rare and precious thing that I think uh, is at its best. Please uh, join me in thanking Rob and Oh, sorry, I thought you were leaving to the washroom. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the washroom before that. <laughs> Thanks for your concern. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the chair would never show such concern. <laughs> um, you know, I'm really moved by, by your uh, analysis, and I can certainly, uh, you know, I've been doing academic work, and well, I've worked in uh, nonprofits and academic work, and, uh, you know, for a long time, and I, I certainly, and, you know, feel, you know, my body was feeling tired and tired as you went on. <laughs> And both my wife and I are academics, and we, you know, we used to take, we used to go on vacations before email, and we didn't, we didn't. Uh, now we, if we want to get a cottage or a cabin or someplace, we always say, oh, it has to have email, you know, because we don't want to get, uh, you know, drowned when we come back. There'll be two thousand emails and all that. Um, one of the things that I think it's, you know, that I have a friend uh, Edmund O'Sullivan from Boise who talks about, you know, the neoliberal settler colonial. <laughs> 
you know, uh, sort of world that we live in as a killing machine. And I think what you're talking about, we need to remember that what's be what's beginning to or not beginning, but it's an ongoing process of, you know, of, 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 of the kind of degradation of the working conditions that we now find ourselves in is, is the process that actually young Marx uh, in, in Hitler was talking about you know in the 19th century and there's that's the, that's the nature of the game and it is this this kind of system this is a killing machine and it's now it's come so far it's now killing us so this is you know we need to <coughs> think about you know how we're going to do something in, in higher education let's keep in mind you know if we don't do something in higher education you know it's what 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 you know what are we going to do? What's going to happen? You know, it's not, it's not going to stop. And anyway, you get the point. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I was depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bud. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to respond to the question about what we say to our grad students and also what you were saying about the transgeneral gen generational thing. Um, I think, and it also, I'm kind of in relation to what Joel said, his last point about individualism creeping in the university. And I think something we really need to talk about um, and cultivate is a real sense of collective and what it means to work collectively because all these processes are so individualizing and they don't only terrorize us but they encourage us to seek out the spaces where we can get and it's like a survivalism um, and an opportunism and um, the flip side of being insecure is self-aggrandizement we have a publication that comes out of one of our colleges called the brag right <laughs> and at the same time that we're all feeling terrible we're all telling everybody about this award and that award and so, so building collective and finding lessons from uh, older generations where a collective ethos was present in the university and reliving that. And um, there's so much going through my head, that's why I'm talking so good. But um, I also just want to say, and I don't usually self-promote, but I just want to put this out there that my colleague Janice Newson and I wrote a book called Academic Callings. Well, we edited it. The university we have had, now have, have and could have. And it's stories from older generations and mid-generational faculties for young faculty so that we have a link back to how it used to be, can know about what existed, and then remake it in our own terms, right, in new terms. So we need to talk, um, and we need to recover some of that collective sensibility that existed, and then again, remake it or reclaim it, you know, just in our present time. Thanks, Claire. That's brilliant. Please join me in uh, thanking Mark.